So I hope the connection is okay. I'm going to see what, yes. So hi, everyone, and welcome to our weekly edition of Reading Hub. Today we have as our guest Natalie Nicholson from Florida, USA. Uh, so hi, um, Natalie. Uh, you can introduce yourself a little bit. Hi, I'm Natalie Nicholson. I live here in Jacksonville, Florida in the United States, where it is a 29 degrees Celsius, and I am very excited about reading to you today. I teach kindergarten, uh, so, and that's Natalie, age five and six. Hmm? Uh, oh, no, I, we are hearing you. Yeah. Yeah, I teach kindergarten, age five and six, and right now we're out of school because of the coronavirus. Oh, so you, you didn't go back to school, right? The kids won't go back to school till no, we're, do, we're doing it online. We're doing it online. Yeah. It's the same here, yeah. but it's glad uh, there is a possible solution. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just uh, say good luck and I'm going to uh, turn off. So have a good reading session. Oh, thank you. Bye. Okay. Sure. Today I'm going to read to you from one of my favorite types of stories and I'm going to show you a book. This is a series of books I've had since I was a little kid and that's been a long time ago. And it's called Junior Classics, Myths and Legends. Today I'm going to read to you one of the stories about a young man named Prometheus. Prometheus, you might have heard that word somewhere before, um, but he was the person, the titan that brought fire back to humans. Um, Greek mythology is really great because it teaches you so many things. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and start this first story here. When Zeus, the king of the Olympian gods, was young and trying to establish his rule, a long and terrible war ensued. All the Olympians gods joined against the Titans who were led by Zeus's father, Cronus, and the mighty Atlas. After 10 long years of fighting, Zeus and his fellow Olympians defeated the enemy. Only a few Titans, particularly Prometheus and his brother Epimetheus, fought on the side of Zeus against their fellow Titans. Now that was not normal, but that's what they did. You see, Prometheus was very wise, wiser even than most of the gods, he knew who the winner of the battle was going to be between the Olympians and the titles. He pursued his impulsive brother, Epimetheus, to also fight on the side of Zeus. Once Zeus emerged victorious, he granted the brothers just rewards. Zeus permitted Prometheus and Epimetheus to populate the earth with creatures and humans. Epimetheus who wasn't exactly a bright kid. His name means afterthought. Foolishly gave all the good qualities to the creatures, strength and speed, the ability to fly, to stay warm in all conditions. He had keen sense of smell, superb and cunning instinct. To live underwater, he gave all of this to the creatures. Sadly, by the time it came for man to be endowed with qualities, there were very few left to make man a match for the beast. Desperate and sorry, he begged his brother for help. Prometheus, whose name means wise, forethought, took over the task of creation and considered a way to make the humans superior to creatures. Prometheus passed on to man the useful arts taught to him by Athena and looked with joy upon his creation. <clears throat> he felt bad, however, because when man sacrificed to gods, the best portion of animals were offered to the Olympians, leaving very little for people. So Prometheus tricked Zeus into choosing one pile of offerings, cleverly disguised to look delicious, but all he was hiding was fat and bones. Zeus fell for the trick and impulsively chose the wrong pile. And from then on, humans got to keep the goods and tasty part of animal offerings, and Zeus got the bones and the fat. This made the king of Olympian very angry. So he punished Prometheus, who was laughing at him. Zeus took fire away from man, 
Let them eat their meat raw, he shouted. Let's see how they keep warm in the winter. Zeus knew that he seemed ungrateful if he directly hurt Prometheus, so the Titan had to help him become king of Olympus so he could do the next best thing. Swearing revenge, he punished humans by taking away their fire. Well, this didn't set well with Prometheus. Daily he looked down with sadness upon his creation. He watched him shiver in the cold and trying to eat raw food. Slowly they began to die. Prometheus could no longer sit by idly. Let's see what he does. Prometheus arranged a meeting with Athena and beseeched her for help. The wise and gracious Athena kindly revealed to Prometheus a hidden backstair interest to Olympias, and he gained interest to the palace of the gods, one of the very few people that did that. Upon arrival, he lit a torch from the fiery chariot of the god Helos, who passed by daily. He broke off a fragment of charcoal he hid it inside the hollow of a giant fennel stalk. He blew out the torch just in case Sp Zeus spotted it. Prometheus then worked his way down the side of the Mount Olympus. And what a perilous journey it was. That rebel Prometheus had taken such a personal risk for man. Now he was faced with getting the fire back down to earth. The winds howled as he strode down the mountains threatening to blow out the coal or huff out this hand. With each step he took, the Titan fully expected to be seen by Zeus and to be struck by a lightning bolt. But Prometheus made it to earth and proudly gave the fire to the humans who were overjoyed. <laughs> Needless to say, soon Zeus started to smell hmm, something cooking. Scents of cooked meat drifted up to Olympus from Earth, and when he looked down, he was furious. There were humans who were supposed to be punished, happily cooking their food and staying warm around fires. The Revenge of Zeus. That was twice that Prometheus had made the king of the Olympians look bad, and this time Zeus was not going to hold back. But get all of that Prometheus had done for him during the war, Zeus had him arrested. He summons from the underworld the three ferocious giants, Geysus, Codas, and Briarus, and he had them take Prometheus to the highest part of Mount Cacacus. On a huge rock, the giants bound the Titan with unbreakable chains. Each day, an enormous eagle, some think it was a vulture, sent by Zeus, would arrive and eat Prometheus' liver, ill, feasting on the helpless Titan. To make matters worse, the liver would grow back overnight and the whole ordeal would happen the following day. For some, some say it was 30 years, some say it was a thousand years, some say it was 30,000 years. For some time, Prometheus endured this excruciating pain and torment. Being a god, he couldn't die. Thus, his ordeal could not be eased. At one point, Zeus offered him a chance to free himself by revealing information that Prometheus knew. Remember, Prometheus could see the future. Zeus wanted to know who would try to challenge him and take over his kingdom. And he wanted Prometheus to tell him this. He said, if you tell me this, then I will set you free. The king of the Olympians promised Prometheus that he would set him free if he identified the, gave the identity of the potential usurper. Stubborn Prometheus informed the messenger god Hermes, I will not, he refused. Prometheus' morals were uncompromising even though his body was bound, his spirits were free, and the Titan refused to submit to threats, torture, and tyranny. Prometheus gets, Prometheus gets unbound. Zeus began to feel bad, believe it or not. He wasn't a mean-spirited god, after all. And deep down, 
he really liked Prometheus for sticking to his ideas. So he offered him a slim glimmer of hope. Prometheus, Zeus told the Titan, that he could go free if two conditions were met. One, an immortal would have to give up his life for Prometheus. Two, a mortal would have to slay the liver-eating eagle. Prometheus thought, what kind of deal is that? What immortal will ever give up his life for a titan? And there was no mortal brave and strong enough to kill that evil beast that feasts on his liver. Unrepentant for his actions and fully aware that he had done the right thing in stealing fire from Olympus and giving to man, Prometheus was resigned to eternal life on his rocks, so to speak. But wait, the story doesn't end there. You see, there was a centaur named Chiron. He was wise and a mortal mentor of many of the Greek heroes. He had been accidentally shot and wounded by one of Hercules' poison arrows. The arrow was deadly and had been dipped in the blood of a dying hydra. But because Chiron was an immortal, he couldn't die. So he lived in horrible pain from the lethal poison. Hearing of the plight of his courageous Prometheus, Chiron volunteered to die in his steed so that his unbearable pain would cease. Now that's a friend. At the same time, conferring his immortality upon the chained Titan. It was a mutual beneficial move and fulfilled the first part of Zeus's terms. Now, where could you find a mortal hero brave enough to challenge the ferocious eagle? Have no fear, passing by Mount Caucasus, one day the world's greatest hero, mighty Hercules, saw Prometheus bound to the rock with the frightful eagle merrily munching on his liver. Armed with his bow and arrow, gift from the gods, mighty Hercules took aim and let fly the missile at the beast. One shot was all it took, and the titan's tormentor was killed instantly by a poison, poison arrow. Prometheus was now free to go. By this time, Zeus realized his fault and foolishness and imposed in imposing such a stern sentence upon a brave Titan. So he invited Prometheus to come and live on Mount Olympus with all of the gods. All was forgiven and our hero rejoined his rightful place at the home of the gods. Zeus did make Prometheus wear a ring in which a piece of the Cacacus ring was set as a symbol of his painful connection with the mountain. This represented the very first time rings were set and ever since then, humans have worn rings in honor of the Titans in gratitude for all the agony he endured on their behalf. The name of brave Prometheus has endured throughout the ages as the world's first rebel and the champion of humanity. He fought against divine authority for his ideas, but ultimately paid a heavy price for his foresight. And that's all I'm gonna to read today about Prometheus and the Firebringer. He kept his morals despite the fact he was in pain and being tortured by Zeus. <laughs> Our second story is the Argonauts. Some of you might have heard or seen a movie called Jason and the Argonauts. It was based on this story. The Argonauts. I have told you of a hero who fought with wild beasts and wild men. Now I'm going to tell you a hero who sailed away into a distant land to win themselves renowned forever in the adventure of the Golden Fleece. Whither they sail, my children, I cannot clearly tell. It all happened so long ago, so long that all has grown dim, like a dream you dreamt last year. And why they went, I cannot tell. Some say it was to win gold. It might have been so, but the noblest deeds which have been done on earth have not been done for gold. It is not for the sake of gold that the Lord came and died, and that the apostles went out to preach and the good news was all the land. The Spartans looked for no reward in money when they fought and died at Thermopylae, and Socrates, the wise 
asked no pay for his countrymen, but lived poor and barefoot all his days, only caring to make men good. And there are heroes in our days also who do noble deeds, but not for good. Our discoverers did not go to make themselves rich when they sailed after one another's to dreary frozen seas, nor did ladies who helped with the Crimean War to drudge in the hospitals of the East, making themselves poor that they might be rich in noble works. Young men too, whom you have known, children and some of them your own kin, did they say to themselves, how much money will I earn? When will they, when they went out to war, leaving wealth and comfort and a pleasant home and all that money can give to face hunger and thirst and wounds and death, that they might fight for their country or their queen. No children, there are things on this earth better than wealth, better than life itself. And that is to have done something before you die, for which good men will honor you and God your father may smile on you. Therefore, will you believe why we should not of the same Argonauts of old, that they too were noble men who planned and did a noble deed, and that therefore their fame has lived and been a told story in a song, mixed up no doubt with dreams and fables, but yet true in its heart. So we will honor these old Argonauts and listen to their story as it stands. We will try to be like them, each of us in our own place, for each of us has a golden fleece to seek and a wild sea to sell over, ere we reach it, dragons to fight, to be our own. And what was that first golden fleece? I do not know, nor do I care. The old Helen said it hung in Colis, which we call the Caesarean coast, nailed to a beech tree in the war god's woods, and that it was a fleece of a wondrous ram who bore Phyrex and Helix across the eunuch sea. But Phyrex and, Phyrex and Helix were the children of a cloud nymph and of the Manuan king. And when a famine came upon the land, their cruel stepmother, Eno, wished to kill them. Oh my goodness. And that her own children might reign and said that there must be sacrifice at an altar to turn away the anger of the guards. So she was willing to sacrifice her own children. So the poor children <clears throat> were brought to the altar and the priest stood ready for his knife. When out of the clouds came a golden ram and took them on his back and vanished. The madness came upon the foolish king Athamas and ruin upon Aino and her children. But Athamas killed one of them in fury and Aino fled from him with the other in her arms and leaped from a cliff into the sea and was changed into a dolphin, such as you have seen, which wanders over the waves forever seeing with the little one clasped in his breast. But the people drove out the king because he had killed the child and he roamed about in misery till he came to an oracle in Delphi. And the oracle told him, you must wander for your sins till the wild beast should feast him as their guest. So he went on in hunger and sorrow for many weary days. So he saw a pack of wolves. The wolves were tearing a sheep, but when they saw him, they fled and left the sheep for him and he ate it. And then he knew the oracle was fulfilled. So he wandered no more, but settled in a town and became king again. But the ram carried the two children far away over the land and sea till it came to Chersonese, and then Hele fell onto the sea. So these narrow straits are called Hellspons after her, and they bear the name until this day. I'm going to look that up. Then the ram flew on to the northeast across the sea which we call the Black Sea now, where the Helens call it Eucene. And at last, they say, he stopped at Colchis on the steep Circaean coast 
and married the daughter of the king and offered a ram in sacrifice. He nailed the ram fleece to the beach in the grove of the war god. And after a while, Physis died and was buried, but his spirit had no rest, for he was buried far from his native land and the pleasant hills of Hellas. So he became in dreams to the hero of the Menai and called sadly by their beds, come please set my spirits free that I may go home to my father and to my kinfolks and the pleasant Minuan islands. And they asked, how shall we set your spirit free? You must sell over the sea and bring home the golden fleece. And then my spirit will come back with it and I shall sleep with my father and have rest and peace. He came thus and called to them often, but when they woke, they looked at each other. Who would dare sail to Colas and bring home the golden fleece? And in all the countries, none was brave enough to try, for the man and the time were not come. Now, Virus had a cousin named Jason, who was king by the sea. There he ruled over the rich Minuan heroes as Athamas, his uncle, ruled in Bosnia. And like Athamas, he was an unhappy man, for he had a stepbrother named Peleus, of whom some say was a nymph son. And there were dark and sad tales about his birth. When he was a babe, he was cast out to the mountains and a wild mare came by and kicked him. Oh my goodness. But a shepherd found him went with his face all blackened by the blow and took him home and called him Peleus because his face was bruised and black. And he grew up fierce and lawless and did many a fearful deed. And he grew up fierce and lawless and did many a fearless deed. And at last he drove out his stepbrother and then he ruled, and then his own brother and he took the kingdom for themselves and ruled over the rich Minuan heroes. So he went up from the sea across the valley through the vineyards and the olive gardens and across the torrent towards Pelion, the ancient mountains whose brows are white with snow. He went up and up into the mountains over marsh, over crag and down till the boy was tired and footsore. Jason had to bear him in his arms so he came to the mouth of a lonely cave and at the foot of a mounting mighty cliff. Above the cliff, the snow wreaths hung, dripping and cracking in the sun. But at its foot around the caves grew all fair flowers and herbs, as if the garden ranged in order, each sorted by itself. There they grew gaily in the sunshine and the spray of the torrent from above while from the cave came the sound of music and a man's voice singing in a harp. Then Jason put down the lad and whispered, fear not, but go in and whomever shall find you, lay their hands upon his knees and say, in the name of Zeus, the father and the gods of men, I am your guest from this day forward. Then the lad went in without trembling, for he too was a hero's son. But when he was within, he stopped and wondered to listen to the magic song. And then he saw the singer lying upon bare skins and fragrant bows. Cherion, the ancient centaur, the wisest of all things beneath the sky. Down to the waist, he was a man, but below he was a noble horse. His white hair rolled over his broad shoulders and his white beard over his broad brown chest. And his eyes were wise and mild and his forehead like a mountain wall. And in his hand, he held a golden harp and struck it with a golden key. And as he struck, he sang till his eyes glittered and filled up the cave with light. And he sang of the birth of time and of the heavens and of dancing stars and of ocean and ether and the fire and the shaping of wondrous earth. 
And he sang of the treasures of the hills and the hidden jewels of the mines and the veins of fire and metal and the virtues of all healing herbs and the speed of birds and of prophecy and of hidden things to come. Then he sang of health and strength and manhood and a valiant heart and of music and hunting and wrestling and all the games that heroes love and of travel, wars, siege, noble death and fight. He sang of peace and plenty and of equal justice in land. He sang of the boy, he sang as the boy listened wide eyed and forgot his errand in the song. And at last, old Chiron was silent and he called to the lad with a soft voice. And the lad ran, trembling, and would have laid his hands upon his knees. But Chiron smiled and said, call hither your father, for I know you and all that has befallen you. And you both are far from the valley, even before you left the town. Then his father came in sadly, and Chiron asked him, why cannot you yourself to me? Why didn't you come to me yourself, is what he's saying. I thought Chiron would pity the lad if he saw him come alone. And I wished to try whether he was fearless and dare venture like a hero's son. So he's saying he was testing out his son. But now I entreat you by Father Zeus, let the boy be your guest till better times and train him in the sons of heroes that he may avenge his father's house. So he wanted his son to be trained as a warrior and that he could take revenge for those who had wronged his father. Chiron smiled and drew the lad close to him. He laid his hand upon his golden locks and said, are you afraid of my horse hoofs, fair boy? And will you be my pupil from this day? I would gladly have your horse hoofs like you. I could sing much songs as yours. And Chiron laughed and said, sit here by me until sundown, when your playfellows will come to you and you shall learn like a king worthy to rule over gallant men. Then he turned to the father and said, you go back in peace and bend before the storm like a prudent man. This boy shall not cross into Anarus again till he has become a glory to you and the house of Alias. And Aeson wept over his son as he went away. He knew he would miss him, but the boy did not weep. So full was his fancy in the strange cave and the centaur and his song and his playfellows whom he were to see. Then Chiron put the lyre in his hand, that was like the golden harp, and taught him how to play it till the sun sunk low behind the cliff and a shout was heard outside. And then in the house came the son of the heroes and many other mighty names, the son of Hercules, the son of Peleus, all hero children. And now Chiron leapt up joyfully and his hooves made the cave resound as they shouted, come out, Father Chiron, come out, see our games. And one cried, I have killed a deer. Another, I took a wildcat among the crag, and Hercules dragged a wild goat after him by his horns. But he was huge as a mountain crag. He carried a bear cub under each arm and laughed as they scratched and bit, for neither tooth nor steel could harm him. Chiron praised them all, each according to his desert. Only one walked apart and silent. That was Eclipius, the too wise child, with his bosom full of herbs and flowers, and round his wrist he had a spotted snake. He came with downcast eyes to Chiron and whispered how he had watched the snake cast his old skin and grow young again before his very eyes and how he had gone down into the village in the vale and cured a dying man with the herbs he had seen a sick goat eat. 
Chiron smiled and said, to each Athen and Apollo give some gift, and each is worthy to his place. But to the child they have given an honor beyond all honor to cure while others kill. So this child had healing power. He's then the lads brought in wool and spit, split it and lighted a blaze fire and others skinned the deer and quartered it and set them to roast among the fire. And while the venison was cooking, they bathed in the snow torrent and washed away the dust and sweat. And then all ate till they could eat no more, for they had tasted nothing since dawn. So it had been all day long since they had eaten and they ate a lot. They drank from the clear spring water, for wine is not fit for growing lads. We know this. And when the remnants were put away, they lay down on their skins and leaves about the fires. And each took the lyre in turn and sang and played with all of his heart. After a while, they all went out to plot to a plot of grass on the cave's mouth. And there they boxed and ran and wrestled and laughed till the stones fell from the cliff. These boys were having fun. Then Chiron took his lyre, lyre and all the lads joined hands. And as he played, they danced to his measure, in and out, around and around. There they danced hand in hand to the nights fell over the land and sea while the black, black gin shone with the broad white limbs and the gleam of their golden hair. They danced all night. The lads danced with them, delighted, and then they slept a wholesome sleep among fragrant leaves of bay, myrtle, marjoram, flowers of thyme, and rose in the dawn, and bathed in torrent and became schoolfellows to the hero's son. Those are herbs we have today, don't we? But, the, but he grew strong and brave and cunning among the pleasant downs of Pelion and the keen hungry mountaineer. And he learned to wrestle and to box and to hunt and to play among the heart. And next he learned to ride. For well, old Chiron used to mount him on his back and he learned the virtues of all herbs. He learned how to cure all wounds and Chiron called him Jason, the healer. And that is his name until the day. There's your Jason. 10 years came and went and Jason was grown to be a mighty man. Some of his fellows were gone and some were growing up by his side. Eclipius was gone to Pelanopolis to work his wondrous cures of men. And some said he used to raise the dead to life. Hercules was gone to Thebes to fulfill those famous labors which have become proverbs among men. And Peleus married a sea nymph and his wedding is famous to this day. Aeneas was gone home to Troy, and many a noble tales you will hear of him. And we'll talk about those later. Jason looked and saw the plains of Thalassus, where the Lapithae bred and the, bred their horses, and the lake of Bobby and the stream which runs northward to Peneus and Tempe. He looked north and saw the mountain wall, which guarded the Manganese shores, Olympus, the seat of the immortal, and Osa and Pelion where he stood. Then he looked east and saw the bright blue sea, which stretched ever forever towards the dawn. Then he looked south and saw the pleasant land with white walled towns and farms nestling among the shores of Landlocked Bay, where the smoke rose blue among the trees. And he knew in the Bay of Pagasai and the rich lowlands and by the sea, there he sighed. Is it true what the heroes tell me that I am I heir to the fair land? And what good would it be to you, Jason, if you were? I would take it and keep it, said Jason. A strong man has taken it and kept it all along. Are you stronger than Peleus the Terrible? I could try my strength with his, said Jason. But Chiron sighed and said, you have many dangers to go through before you rule. By the sea, 
many a danger and many a woe and strange troubles and strange lands such as no man has ever seen. The happier I, said Jason, to see what man never saw before. And Chiron sighed again. The eaglet must leave the nest when it has fledged. Will you go by the sea? Then promise me two things before you go. Jason promised and Chiron answered, speak harshly to no soul whom you meet, promise number one, and stand by the words that you speak, promise number two. Jason wondered why Chiron asked him of this, but he knew that centaurs were prophets and saw things before they happened. So he promised and leaped down the mountain to take his fortune like a man. He went down through the Artemis thickets and across the downs of time till he came to a vineyard wall and the pomegranates and the olives in the glens. And among the olives roared aureus, all foaming with summer blood. On the bank stood a woman, all wrinkled, gray, old, her hair, head shook, haze on her breast and her hands shook palsy on her knees, and when she saw Jason, she spoke whining. Who will carry me across the flood? Jason was bold and hasty and was just going to leap up onto the flood, and yet he thought twice before he leapt. So loud roaring was the torrent, all brown from the mountain rains and silver veins with melting snow while underneath he heard the boulders rumbling like the tramps of horsemen and the rolls of wheels. Hmm, this was shaking rocks. But the old woman whined even more. I'm wake and oh, fair youth, for Harry's sake, carry me over the torrent. And Jason was going to answer her scornfully when Chiron's words came to his head. Hmm, so he said, for Hera's sake, the queen of the immortals on Olympias, I will carry you across the torrent unless we both are drowned midway. He kept his word. Then the old dame leapt up on his back as nimble as a goat and Jason staggered in wondering. The first step was up to his knees. The second step was up to his waist and the stones rolled about his feet his feet slipped about the stones, so he went on staggering and panting while the old woman cried on his back. Oh, you have wet my mantle. Do you make game of poor old souls like me? Jason had half a mind to just drop her and let her get through by herself. But Chiron's words were in his mind, and he said only, Patience, mother, the best horse may stumble someday. At last, he staggered to the shore and set her down upon the bank and a strong man he needed to have or would or that would wild water he never would have crossed. I'm sorry, let me read that again. At last, he staggered to the shore and set her down upon the bank and a strong man he needed to have been or that water would have never been crossed. He lay panting whew, among the bank and then leapt up to go on his journey. He cast one last look upon the woman, but he thought she should have at least said thank you. And as he looked, she grew fairer than all women, taller than all men on earth. Her garments shone like winter sea and her jewels like the stars of heaven. And over her forehead was a veil woven in golden clouds of the sunset. And though the veil, she looked at him with great soft eyes, with great eyes, mild and awful, which filled all the glens with light. Jason fell on his knees and hid his face between his hands. And she said, I am queen of Olympus, Hera, the wife of Zeus, and thou hast done to me what I will do for thee. Call on me in your hour of need and try if the immortals can forget. And when Jason stood up, she rose from the earth like a pillar of tall white cloud and floated across the mountain peaks toward Olympus and the holy hill. 
Then a great fear fell on Jason, for at the wall he grew light of heart. He blessed old Chiron, and surely the centaur is a prophet. And guessed what will come next? Hmm. Then he went down toward the town, and he walked. He found that he had lost one of his sandals in the flood. And as he went through the streets, the people came out to look at him. So tall and bare was he, but some of the elders whispered, and at last one of them stopped Jason and called him, Bear lad, who are you, and whence you come from? My name, good father, is Jason, and I have come from Pelion from above, and my errand is to your king, to tell me where he is. But the old man started and grew pale. Do you not know the oracle, my son? that you go boldly through the town with one sandal on? I am but a stranger here and know of no oracle, but what of my one sandal? I lost the other in Anros while I struggled with the flood. Then the old man looked back to his companions and one sighed and another smiled. At last he said, I will tell you, lest you rush to your ruins. I will tell you, the oracle in Delphi, he said, that is a man wearing one sandal, should take the kingdom from Peleus and keep it for himself. Therefore, beware when you go to his palace, for he is fierce and cunning. I am Jason, the son of Aeson, the eye of all land. Then Peleus lifted up his hand and eyes and wept, or seemed to weep, and blessed the heavens which had brought his nephew to him, never to leave before no more. For he said, I have but three daughters and no son. You shall be my heir, heir, then and rule the kingdom after me and marry whichever daughter you choose. Though a sad kingdom you will find it and whoever rules it is gonna be a miserable man. But come in, come in and feast. So he drew Jason in, whether he would or not, and spoke to him so loving and feasted him so well that Jason's anger passed. But at last he said to Peleus, why do you look so sad, uncle? And what did you mean just now when you said that whoever rules this kingdom is going to be sad? Sorry. Peleus sighed heavy and told him, like a man who had to tell something dreadful and was afraid to begin. But at last, for seven young years and more than I have ever known, a quiet night, and no more will he who comes after me till the golden fleece be brought home. So that's where we're going to stop today. We know that Jason made it back home. He kept his word to Chiron, the mentor, and he's out now to look for the golden fleece. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much, Natalie, for reading sure. us two interesting stories with their important messages. We really appreciate you taking you so part. Welcome. In in our reading hub and i hope everyone enjoyed following your stories as much as i did and i wish you a good day thank you so thank much thank you i appreciate you thank you <laughs> have a nice Be safe. day you too